My name is Nick Vavis. I'm setting out on a journey through the Diocese of Brooklyn and Queens. My goal? To visit eight parishes in one day and show you why we live in a city of churches. In case you missed it, here's my journey so far. I began my day by visiting St. James Cathedral, the Bishop's Church, before making my way to nearby St. Boniface. I then took a trip into Queens to visit Our Lady of Mount Carmel in Astoria, and then to Forest Hills and Our Lady Queen of Martyrs. After touring the church, I set out to my final destination in Queens, Our Lady of Snows in Floral Park. Hey guys, thanks for joining me again. Now I'm still here in Queens. I just got off the F train from my last stop, Our Lady Queen of Martyrs. I'm now waiting for the bus to take me to my next stop, Our Lady of Snows in Floral Park. And here's my bus. I've gotten really good use of my Metro card today. So far today, I've walked, I've taken the subway, and now I'm on the bus. City involvement with surface transit it began in September 1919 when Mayor John Francis Highland organized private entrepreneurs to operate emergency buses to replace four abandoned storage battery streetcar lines. Most of the routes that followed were managed by private companies. By the 1950s, the city only operated service in Staten Island and Brooklyn and a few lines in Queens and Manhattan. But by 1980, the city had acquired the rest of Manhattan and by 2006, the remaining routes in Queens. New York City really does have the best public transportation system. You can take it to get just about anywhere. And this is my stop. Here we are, Our Lady of the Snows. Now, this church has a bit more of a modern look than the last church I was at, Our Lady Queen of Martyrs. That was a bit more of a Gothic look on the outside. But let's go in and check it out. Come on. Snows, Nick. Thanks for having you have you with us. Appreciate it. As you can see, this is a brand new church. It's the newest church in the Diocese of Brooklyn. I'm happy that you're here. I'd like to give you a tour and show you around. That'd be great. I smell the fresh paint. I'm yes. See it. Yes. Okay. This is the uh, the vestibule of the church. People right. enter this way. This is the main entrance of the church. Main entrance. And when they approach the uh, gathering area, mm -hmm. they are greeted with many of the oh, saints. So we have St. Jude, St. Anthony, Mother Teresa, because there's a lot of Indian people in the parish and they have great devotion to Mother Teresa. And then we have uh, a statue of San Lorenzo Ruiz. Mm -hmm. He's a Filipino saint. We have a large Filipino population also in the parish. So it reflects the ethnicity. Exactly. The the, ethnicity those two statues the parish. represent the two biggest uh, ethnic groups in the parish. Wow. And then we have a statue of uh, the little flower, mm -hmm. a statue of John Paul II, who was our Pope before Pope Benedict and mm -hmm. who's uh, pointing towards our Blessed Mother. He had great devotion to Mary. Mm -hmm. And then the statue of Mary, which was from the old church and it was restored to be put here in the new church. Are these all from the old church? Just the statue of the Blessed Mother. Just the one of the that's, Blessed Mother. That's the only one from the old church. Who did all of these, the ones you just showed me? They are from these? Italy, from Dumetz in Italy. They're beautiful. And of course, the last but not least, St. Joseph. St. Joseph. Husband of Mary. And uh, this is our devotional area in the church. Mm -hmm. People like to come here and say prayers. Your prayer candles. We have candles here. We also have prayer cards by each statue so that they can say a prayer before the statue. This gathering area, Nick, is a great place for people to talk and have conversation before they go into the actual church. People really enjoy this before Mass and after Mass, to come here and talk and enjoy each other's company. And so we're glad the gathering area is big enough to accommodate everybody. And it is beautiful. And the stained glass in the doors, is this what we'll see inside the church? Yes. It's all part of the same? Yes. Okay. Perfect. I'd love to see inside. Come on in. Okay. Thank you. so quiet. Yes, it well is. Lit. It is beautiful, very nice. 
Was it intentional to keep it so quiet? Yes, we wanted to have that transition from the gathering area into the main body of the church, that when people came in here, this is a place of prayer, mm -hmm. and this is a place of worship. And the idea to have the, um, the hole cut in the center with all this light coming in. Well, the natural skylight lets the natural light come right through. Mm -hmm. It adds to the brightness of the church. It really does. The whole effect is great. Yeah. And then I'd love to go around too, and if you could show me some of the stations of the cross and some of the sure. other things, I'd love to see that. Well, starting over here, Nick, we have the Stations of the Cross. They were designed by a, an artist from South America, mm -hmm. and they were painted in 1962. And it was through the liturgical artist, uh, the liturgical consultant, Mr. Tony D'Ambrosio, uh -huh. that we were able to get these stations. And when he showed them to us, we saw how beautiful they were, how large they were, and how graphic they were. And we asked him to make the frames, the wooden frames, and the signs underneath, mm -hmm. and the numbers, and the crosses that go with them. And as he designed them, Mr. D'Ambrosio did a very good job in uh, providing stations of the cross that are truly beautiful, mm -hmm. and helping people to pray the stations. So that's one of the, the nice features about the church, is the stations of the cross. It's a very, um, the portrait itself is very elaborate, it's detailed, yeah. it really is nice. Mm -hmm. It's very nice. And then, of course, the beautiful stained glass. Well, there's a story about that, too, Nick. Tell me about that. The story about the stained glass is that uh, the, all of the glass in the church, from the windows, the doors, all of the stained glass came from the chapel that used to be at Kennedy Airport. Really? 20 years ago, it closed and it was torn down. Mm. And that all of the windows were put in storage. And they were sitting there in storage all these years, not being used. And it was Father Jim Devine, who was the chaplain of the airport right. at that time. He told me about them, and he said, go and take a look at them. Yes. Says, I think you'll like them. And when I saw them, and I saw how beautiful they were, I realized they would fit well in a new church. Wow. And so, through the kindness of the diocese, we were able to get those windows mm -hmm. and make them fit into the spaces that we had here in the church. So the, this was constructed around the glass? The That's correct. The glass. So all of the stained glass that we're seeing, even on the altar, all, all of, of this was in storage glass. for 20 years? All of the stained glass That's was amazing. there. It is so it's beautiful amazing. and um, has many different symbols, the grapes and the wheat and the stars and the moon. The colors are so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And as you can see on a sunny day like today, uh, when the uh, sunlight shines through, how beautiful oh, they are. It just are. comes beaming through. It's so bright. It's so vibrant. That's the one thing that the people really, really like about this church is the brightness and the, the windows certainly add to that brightness. This is all new, the pews as well? Oh, all the, these the were pews, pews are, are brand new mm -hmm. uh, and they are comfortable. People like them because they have cushions on them. They're easy. Yeah, they look comfortable. They are very comfortable. And uh, no matter where you sit in the church, you can see the altar. The visibility oh, is right. good. The sight lines are very good. You can see the altar. And you can see the sanctuary from any uh, seat that you're in. So it's a very uh, easy church to pray in and to worship in. The crucifix that you see here above the main altar mm -hmm. is the crucifix that was in the other church. And the people really liked that crucifix, and so we brought it over here, mm -hmm. and Mr. D'Ambrosio made that background for it, and we um, illuminated the whole thing from below. It looks great. Right. And it's very the people really appreciated the transition from the old church to the new church, the new church. with this crucifix. That's an important part of our... And then the tabernacle. Is there anything you can talk yes. about that area? Yes. The tabernacle is a... Uh, tabernacle that came from the Church of St. Gregory in Belrose. Mm -hmm. They gave it to us. We were very happy to accept it from them. We had it restored mm -hmm. so that it would be uh, looking the way it's looking now. Looks like it's brand new. It does look new. And over here, Nick, is where the choir sits. The choir that we have uh, is a beautiful choir of all church volunteers. Are they local parishioners yes. in your choir? Yes. Mrs. Lisa Kelly is mm -hmm. our choir music director, and she has uh, directed the choir for over 25 years, and she does a beautiful job with them. 
Was, was there ever um, <clears throat> an idea to have a pipe organ, like you see in some of the cathedrals and the churches? I think it'll be pipe organ. Uh, a little too expensive for us right now, but yeah, yeah there's, there's that, that, right? It's expensive. <laughs> but uh, we did buy a new organ, though, mm -hmm. and this organ uh, is our brand new organ because the other organ in the church that we had was uh, wearing out. It was starting to fade out, and we needed a new organ, so we we included the new organ as part of our budget for the new church, and it's it's a beautiful organ. It sounds really great on Sundays, and the people appreciate the uh, the music that's given them here. Is there anything else that was brought over from the old church that's of significance, that's important to you, besides the crucifix and the tabernacle? Well, the tabernacle is not from the old church, right? but the crucifix is from the old church. As well as the, uh, the processional cross that we use to start each liturgy that the altar server carries in, that's mm -hmm. from the old church, the old church as well, yes. And, and then, then everything, everything else is pretty new, though. Everything else Correct. is new, yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, the altar mm -hmm. that was consecrated by Bishop DiMarzio on August 5th, and he uh, poured the oil on the altar, and he wiped it in to the altar, and he... And that's the significance. He explained how the altar represents Christ. Mm -hmm. That's why the priest always reverences the altar when he comes to it, because the altar represents Christ. Mm -hmm. And Christ invites us to come to his table to be nourished and strengthened. So the altar is a beautiful altar, again, kind of matching Where did the this emblem. come from, the altar? The altar was constructed by Mr. Tony D'Ambrosio, okay. who was the liturgical consultant. We also had a, an architect that was part of the project. Mm -hmm. The architect was Martin DeSapio and Brad Worthington. They constructed all of the new church? They designed it. Mm -hmm. Designed they, it? They designed it. Mm -hmm. How long was the entire process of building the new church? How long did it take? It started uh, to be built in April of 2007, mm -hmm. and it was completed this past August, August of 2008. That seems quick, like just over a year? It was over a year, a little over a year. Okay. But there was a lot of years of planning and preparation for it. So tell me a bit about the history um, from the old church to the new church. Tell me about the old church. What is the old church? Well, the old church was built as an auditorium gymnasium mm -hmm. in 1953. And the intention was to okay. have it as a gym and an auditorium, but then the parish needed a place to worship. The parish was started in 1948. Where were they worshiping then? In a small chapel okay. that was there church from 1948 to 53, but by the time 1953 came, the parish had grown so much they needed a bigger worship space, mm -hmm. so they started to use what was intended to be the gymnasium. The gymnasium. So was it ever used as a gymnasium at all? No. No. <laughs> 55 years it was used as a church, mm -hmm. and it was a dream of the original uh, people here to uh, see a church built one day, and some of them are still here. Really? Some of them remember the beginnings of the parish, and they uh, wanted a church but never really had one. So this is their first freestanding church. So was there a lot of excitement, I'm thinking, as the idea came to construct the new church and move everyone from the gymnasium? That must have been a very exciting time for everyone, I think, for yourself and the priests. It was very exciting to, yeah. to go through that. I uh, had a lot of help and a lot of support. And this is something that was a co total community involvement. It was. Okay. Who, who was the support? Who, who reached out to help? You know, who was behind all of that? Well, we had uh, two different uh, fundraising campaigns, mm -hmm. and all volunteer parishioners came through to uh, run the campaigns mm -hmm. and to raise the money, and uh, had a lot of people pitching in. And here it is. And finally, it's here. And it's done. Monsignor, when did you decide 
that your calling was to go into the priesthood. What made you choose? For myself, like my first year in college, I went to Loyola Marymount and I studied theology the first year, and I kind of knew that wasn't for me. What made you choose the priesthood? Well, each priest could tell his own story, and mm -hmm. each priest has a different vocation story, but mine began very early in my life. I went to a Catholic grammar school, mm -hmm. Lady Mount Carmel in Astoria, and I had a lot of uh, sisters teaching in the school and mm -hmm. a lot of priests in the parish who I became very friendly with. And as I became friendly with the priests, I began to realize the work that they were doing was so important. Right. Being with people at critical moments in their life, and mm -hmm. I looked up to them as my heroes. The priests in the parish were great priests, and I wanted to be like them from mm -hmm. a very early age. And so I uh, went to Cathedral Prep Seminary in Brooklyn at the time, and mm -hmm. later on to the Major Seminary. And uh, I felt the call was there from an early age because I wanted to follow the footsteps of my parish priests. And I had a good Catholic religious family. Mm -hmm. It was very encouraging to my vocation. So it made sense to you, would you say? Yes, I felt very comfortable Did doing the work. naturally, that whole progression? That yes. Path. Each year, as I got older, I realized this is where God was calling me to, mm -hmm. uh, to work. Have you always been a New Yorker? I hear Brooklyn and a lot of your yes. studying and your history. I grew up in uh, this diocese, and mm -hmm. uh, the only time I was out of the diocese was when I was in the uh, major seminary in Albany, New York, Our Lady of Angels Seminary, mm -hmm. because the seminary at Huntington was too full at the time and couldn't okay. take us all, so we had to be split up into different seminaries at that time. Yeah. Now we wish we had more seminarians and more men studying for the priesthood. Hopefully, right. they will be. So you can take the priest out of New York and the city, but you can't. Right. Uh, well, Monsignor, thank you so much for sharing that with me. I appreciate that. You're welcome. And I'd love to take a look at the old church if we could, if you take me over there. Sure, I'd be happy. What we're talking about. I'd be happy to show <laughs> it to you. Great. I'll no problem. You. It's out through the main entrance. Yes. Mm -hmm. Construction. Yeah, this is what used, used to be the church uh, from 1953 until 2008. For 55 years, this was the place of worship for the parish. Mm -hmm. Even though it was built as a gymnasium auditorium, it was always used as a church. And um, the plan was that when the new church was constructed, mm -hmm. that this building would revert back to its original purpose. And that's what's happening now. Uh, I might uh, add that all of the furnishings, the religious furnishings, the altar mm -hmm. and the uh, every bit of religious furnishings that was in here is now being used in some other church or chapel in the Diocese of Brooklyn. Really? Where was the altar? The altar originally was up here at the front of the room, mm -hmm. uh, but in 1979 the pews went, went small ways. ways, yes, mm -hmm. the pews went this way. But in 1979, there was a re restoration or renovation of this building, mm -hmm. and the altar was placed over here, and the seats were placed on three sides. The altar was where the uh, parishioners sat. Correct. Right. And so I noticed the stained glass is still preserved, it's still yes. here. What's going to happen with that? Well, for the time being, we're going to leave that here. Leave that here. Yeah. And is there anything else that's staying here as a reminder or a commemorative? Well, pretty much we're going to uh, take everything out and start from scratch and rebuild it. Already we've put new lights in. The uh, lighting that used to be here, that was chandelier lighting, is now in St. Peter and St. Paul Church in Williamsburg. They needed lighting down there. We were very happy to give it to them so it could be used there. And new lighting has already been installed. Now electrical work is going on. The place has to be rewired. And once the electrical work is done, then we're going to start putting a floor down, a gym floor. Gymnasium. Right. So what's the sense when you're in this room? What do you, what do you feel? Or what's your sentiment for this? Well, there's a lot of nostalgia. A lot of nostalgia when you come in here because, you know, this was the place where the Eucharist was celebrated, where the sacraments were celebrated for many, many years. A lot of history. A lot of history in this building. Yeah. You know, Nick, the parish actually began in 1948. Mm -hmm. uh, this area was developed after World War II. Many uh, settlers here 
lived in the Glen Oaks Village, which, which was built at that time, was 2,900 apartments. Mm -hmm. And many men, after they had served in the uh, World War II, they started their families here in this parish. Right. And the area started to grow and, and blossom, and that's why the need for a parish developed. So that in 1948, uh, Bishop Malloy, who was the bishop at the time, asked Father William Murray mm -hmm. to come to this area and start a parish, which they named Our Lady of the Snows. And what is, who is Our Lady of the Snows, or what is that? Our Lady of the Snows is a uh, wonderful title of Mary. Mm -hmm. It goes way back to a story in the year 352 in mm -hmm. Rome, where there was a snowfall in August, if you can believe that, in August. Hard to believe. <laughs> yes. A snowfall in August on a particular spot. Yeah. And that's where the original church was built of Our Lady of the Snows. And um, so we have that beautiful title here. Not too many parishes have that title. Right. But we, uh, we began humble beginnings in 1948. Mm -hmm. And since then, the parish has grown and blossomed and developed into a very, very active parish. And you're very lucky and blessed to have that. Yes, it sounds like. so many good people here yeah. willing to give of their time, their talent, and their treasure yeah. to make this parish the to great parish it, it is. Monsignor, thank you so much. I can't You're thank welcome. you enough. This was so interesting. It's been a pleasure having and you. Good luck. I'm happy for you for the new church. Thank you it's very beautiful. much. Wow, Our Lady of the Snows was amazing. So that's three for three beautiful churches here in Queens. It's been a great day so far. I've learned a lot of history, seen some great churches, plenty of exercise, and some great New York pizza. Now I'm ready for my long trek back to Brooklyn. I'm off to St. John the Baptist. I'll see you there.